I appreciate you are here despite a very boring football game going next door. <laughs> but if I see you are disappearing there, I know I'm in trouble. But I would like to ask you, those who have nothing to do with biology, just say me. Me. Yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, good. So I hope the rest will be able to enjoy. <laughs> I didn't say to which extent. Our untouched virgin, as far as biology goes. All right, so. As the uh, introduction went, so I try to give you my, my view and the way I feel about it, about the field of genomics, and in the first part, I try to bring us all on the same page as much as time allows. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Please don't throw anything useless. I accept... Uh, Hamburgers, concrete. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, please ask questions. I have I have slides to show, but I don't have to of course, because you may get carried away, and it may be even more interesting. So, there's no question. I even for those who are not biologically savvy, that uh, they will say, oh, that the DNA and uh, life on the earth, that the DNA provides the code essentially for everything. So we say there are always exceptions. We need to accept that, right? So, but by and large, DNA is coding whatever is living on this planet. So it's providing the information. And there is, maybe this is for more human, of course, there are these, it's partitioned into chromosomes. So, you know, let's say units, which are organizing that that DNA, and that DNA is packed in the cells and a certain coding potential. And uh, already that coding potential has, of course, gone through, I would say, many stages for considerations and uh, things like how much is there, how much is real, how much is junk, and so on and so forth. Now, I would say, current state of the matter, there is no junk at all. Everything has the meaning. We just don't know which one, which is, of course, uh, exciting, but also a bit troublesome. So frequently, the analogy of the book is used to describe the genome, right? This is a very thick book. It is about 3 billion of uh, American notation or Anglo-Saxon notation, 3 billion letters, uh, if I fell over just Excuse me. <laughs> well, it's tricky. Anyway, but of course the the point is that if it were read, it would be difficult to extract any meaning because in a nutshell it would be a sort of string or rows and rows and pages and pages of uh, four letters, A C G N T, which are the letters of genetic alphabet the information is coded. Now, let me, if I use this, or if I stretch the analogy of that book a bit further, so I would like to give you the, the flavor how I, I see it, so we can, of course, call genome a book of life, which I would say it certainly is. Maybe chromosome would be a chapter or paragraph, a subunit. Gene as a coding unit would be a sentence triplet of nucleotides, so these three consecutive letters will be a word, and a base will be an alphabet letter, and again in that form. Now if we, let's say, look into the one part, so the current state of the matter is that, you know, there's a string of letters, and I don't want to insult any Hungarians among us, and I already apologize to one I know. And if there are more among I apologize to you, but the point is that, you know, in Hungar Hungarian language is using Latin alphabet. And of course, you can kind of read it, and you can infer, you can guess things, because there are some words which are kind of look similar to you, but the meaning is hidden to us, and of course, if you get Nietzsche written in Hungary, maybe you are a bit lost. 
But of course, the language, AB, which we all here in this room understand, would be English, and that Hungarian sentence is, I would say, Google Translator version, but I ask him right to help me out for the next presentation. So the point is that we are, let's say, we can read genomes. I think we can read genomes to a large extent, but we actually don't understand them fully. We don't understand even the simplest genome on this, on this planet, which would be bacterial, which would be viral genome. So even those smallest, these, their secrets are not completely known to us. All right. So DNA is a medium for storing information, but the information, of course, needs to be somehow propagated, somehow expressed, and indeed, earlier 60s, last century, it's, it's amazing, we talk last century, 1960. So it was uh, Francis Crick postulated the flow of uh, that information, and uh, kind of, let's say, also the way the things are on this planet and in the world. And here, I would say, something what is written in our genomes or in genomes of all those organisms, we would like to analyze, to study, to look which bothers us occasionally. There would be a like genotype. And then, so what we are, what, how we function, how, what we can measure, what we can, of course, may, let's say, see uh, in the gross generalization would be phenotype. Now, there is a connection between two, very intimate connection between these two entities. The trouble is that again comes from the fact that we don't understand. So we have these two pieces of, uh, let's say, one is information and one is propagation of that information, but we, we don't know everything how come, how come. Now it goes the way, it goes so as a storage medium being DNA, it is most of the time going via intermediate, which is RNA, which will be transcription, and then this is on the same level of, let's say, information. There are four letters, but then things get complicated because that information from DNA is translated into proteins, and there that language consists already of 20 letters. So which, of course, means also many more combinations available. Now, historically, I would say the history of molecular biology is moving with like speed of, of light. Uh, so I would say in historically recent uh, time, it was assumed that it's just going one way, it's one directional. And uh, now it's clear that it's not really the case. There are heavy crosstalks from one level to another. There are, e each level is influencing the other. Again, this is adding to the level of complexity which we actually, again, don't understand yet. And of course, uh, it's obvious to, I would say, biologists among us, but uh, to those where uh, maybe they need some training, let me illustrate it on this example. So, in a male and female, what this cartoon shows, this is a so-called karyotype, so when the chromosomes condense, they form into this unit, which you may recall on the slide previously, there are 23. And as, as, essentially, male and female karyotype on chromosome setup is almost identical, but on a, let's say, sexual chromosome, which is uh, XY for male and XX for, for female. Again, please forgive me, there are simplifications. Now, you would say that the difference, let's say that X and Y, of course, X chromosome is large, it's understandable. Uh, y chromosome is small, it's also understandable. And of course, what makes the difference, I mean, principally, is this, is this coding sequence, which is called SRY, which is, let's say, sex determining uh, factor. Now, and that would be on the level of genotype, all right? Now, that, that piece of sequence there, which, is, which females are conveniently missing, 
course, is responsible for this large phenotypic difference. All right? So, of course, these differences are remarkable, but they are more subtle ones, I can assure you. So, but again, to illustrate the point that, of course, what is the difference between the genotype or genome and phenotype? Are you still with me? Yeah. <laughs> I see Adam's face, so we have a deal. If he turns his back, that I need to speed up. All right, so that's for this point. So we can read this, we don't understand it, but we are even less informed about how come that these things are happening. Again, for many things. All right, the things are, of course, much more complicated and we are of course carrying our genetic history with us right we are of course sharing genomes with our fathers and mothers and then as propagated from grandfathers grandmothers, and so on and so forth and of course that's let's say the past it's in our genetic makeup but then it moves to a level of presence where everything was happening in our cells so let's say again somehow encoded we can read it again, but not understand. On this cartoon, it's kind of in very in this uh, right bottom corner. It's written environment, but please believe me that uh, the currently contribution of environment to our let's say being is really significant. Some of you may recall that until recently there was like two camps fiercely fighting with a nature versus nurture as it's called so nature something with our genes and nurture what is environment but that contribution of environment is really significant including ours now drinking beer or wine or being in dark room so it's somehow working on our genes now the point is that maybe we can measure this we can look at that with the methods so or method i will tell you shortly about hopefully we can measure intensity of light in this room, we can measure, let's say, our consumption of alcohol, but there are some underlying elements or components of that environment which we actually don't know how to determine. The, again, another level of complexity, oh, that was here, thank you. <laughs> uh, is that, let's say, this unmeasurable component of environment which play differently on each of us, but of course that level of influence is somewhere here. So you know, it's exciting, it's very complex, we don't know enough for sure, and that's a lot of work ahead of us which is, which is interesting and exciting. So, good evening. So now, you know, in this crowd, have we got any homozygotic twins among us? <laughs> I don't see any, but that may be for different reason. So, let's say there are many reasons what makes us different, and uh, of course, even homozygotic twins are different, in case you are wondering. But uh, let's say, there, that variation among us, of course, country that's, that's uh, geographically distributed, it's uh, depending upon the, uh, as I say, geographic, but it of course depends upon the genetic makeup, where, what have we got from where, and to which degree. And until recently it was let's say, assumed that the largest degree of variation is this, as it's called, it's a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, so that we would vary from male among us just by one base here and there, <coughs> roughly 1%. But these days, uh, much more prominent is actually, let's say, what is called structural variation. The actual large blocks of genomes are rearranged and each, for each of us, slightly differently. And how things come together, uh, that's what matters. You know? So it's almost that the mosaic or jigsaw puzzle, we can assemble maybe very, very similar picture for all, all of us, 
but slightly different. You know, different hue of blue, for example, for a sky. And all that, of course, contributes to heredity. And let's say the trio is a very powerful unit of the, of the research. Of course, the trio, because two strangers kind of meet together uh, to conceive a new generation which actually carries that information on. And of course, this, the, the, the again, different scientific or different experimental setup requires different size of this group or cohort, but still, it is, let's say, the starting point which we would like to have to elucidate these differences on the genetic makeup and how it's propagated. All right? I would like to acknowledge my family. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter said she would come. I don't know if she's here, maybe yes. But uh, anyway, so you see some features which are shared and some which are, of course, different. Well, glasses, yeah. <laughs> That's a, it's acquired, uh, acquired features. Uh, maybe Lamarck would uh, appreciate that. You know, it's important that uh, we look at the things in certain contexts. If I sequence my genome and on its own right, this is very, I would say its value is rather rather low. It may be valuable for me, but uh, scientifically I think it's uh, lacking something. And that something is really a context. I asked this question this morning already, but I dare to ask it again. I try to see. so. Maybe you can do the same thing, those without biology. So now the question is, you can come to me now and you get your genome sequence on the spot. Who would come? You can say me because I don't see what you say. So some of you would, some of you would. That's good. But think about it because it's not that trivial and implications can be even severe. You may learn things which you actually don't want to know. And that may not always be nice. So these things are, are there as well. All right, so I, I have this model here, which is now a bit in the dark. It was on the stage in this prominent uh, position. And I would say DNA is uh, really a, a beautiful molecule. And it has certain structure. Again, it is maybe spot like a yeah, so please uh, lift it and hang it high. Come to close it. Yes. Well, you know, I can kick it and it's very Anyway, that's a that's a model. It's of course uh, very very short. It has I think 21 base pairs compared to human genome, which has uh, three billion, give or take, a couple of uh, millions. But it's uh, really, it is, uh, so here, right, so you see this uh, red and violet, maybe. You are told, to be my, be my money. All right. I will hold, I will. So here, this, this uh, red and uh, violet, this is, let's say, framework with both things together. Don't worry, you, won't, you have no work to cut. <laughs> and there are these then these uh, flat like stacks of uh, two color pairs, this red and and uh, blue. You can recline it. And yellow and uh, and uh, green. Oh, thank you. It's using it well out. <laughs> <laughs> I will break this two. So it helps it together. But these these things in between. This is what actually this is the coding, right? And now. That's something what uh, we would like to know. This, this things in between the bases, as we call them, this is actually how code is written. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My assistant. Thank you. Actually, I had very handsome colleagues, but they are hiding in the <laughs> but, good job. <laughs> anyway, so let's now let me shift the gears a bit, right? And let's bring me, let bring you to the 
let's say, how we can read the things. And I would say, by and large, it's uh, thanks or due, or we can blame this gentleman, Fred, Fred Sanger, who unfortunately died last, uh, last year, about a year ago. And he figured out the way uh, we can read that code. Now, uh, it is using this principle of base pairing. I don't know if you know this either from Enhance My Assistant or the cartoon. There are actually two letters come together. Right? And that pairing is almost invariable. It's uh, yellow and green, which would be G and C, let's say. Well, two old building blocks and A, T, which come together, or vice versa. This pairing actually is a boon for us because that allows us to read that code, thanks to this pairing, okay? And he figured out a way how to read that. Now, let me try to maybe simplify that for you. So we have the double strand molecule, that would be the part of the model. Unfortunately, the model is too fragile. If I start unwinding it, then it would just disintegrate. They would have some fun maybe to put pieces together. But imagine that you would unwind that, and you would see these bars which represent these stacks, okay? And now, what happens, that we actually have half of that strand, or one strand, so if I go back, it works, it's almost as if I slice this in between and I know one part and I would like to determine the second part, but again the information I use for that, uh, which helps me or which does the trick actually, is this invariant pairing, all right? So now we need some things coming come together. It doesn't work on its own right but I will spare you of details unless uh, you really are hungry for some information. But the way is that you see that we have I think, A and T on the top, so they come together and it goes, there are different flavors of the method, I would say. <laughs> and then we detect that base which is incorporated or which is extended. Again, please bear in mind that this is for us unknown. Right? But again, thanks to that pairing principle, we can determine that sequence, as we call it. And then, basically, we call it, again, as I said, we determine the identity of incorporated base or the building block. And then, it, it's an iterative process, and eventually we read as long as the system allows us. It can be short, it can be long. Uh, the length matters, of course, we all know that, uh, because it's useful to certain exercises, but uh, I digress. Now, I put these two pictures together because when the first human genome was published, or announced that it's kind of completed, although it's not completed even today. Uh, so, with hindsight, it was more on the par of landing on the moon. So, amazing technological achievement. But unfortunately, on its own right, that publication explained, or that finding, or these findings explain relatively little on the basis of that variation, of, of that enormous heterogeneity among us and all other organisms on this planet. It simply did not answer the question. Again, achievement, as the moon, of course, landing on the moon brought us microwave ovens and so on and so forth, so so, so the genome, but again, that principle explanation wasn't there. Oops. Thank you. Are, are you okay? Good. Now, the, the little trouble, and you know that the moon landing program was then terminated because it somehow also was not delivering, right? Yes, sure, again, achievement there, but not truly delivering what people thought it would be there. But. Luckily, maybe, for, for all of us, 
that realization that we don't know everything and we cannot find out everything from that answer provided now maybe 14. Yeah. I press the button which I shouldn't have. <laughs> Or should I have much earlier. <laughs> you, you learn every day, Sidney. Silly buttons. Was it you, Boston? No, you, you wash your hands. Anyway. The point is that it actually variation among us is a certain relevance, right? It makes us uh, susceptible or talented for certain things. Susceptible to disease, talented to maybe uh, running faster or pedaling to steep hills very easily. And that, I, in my view, spawned or triggered enormous uh, technology development which has brought us to the point where we are today. Now, only as a remark, the point is, or one of the, let's say, relevant parts uh, to add here is, to, to get there to that first two genomes, or which were composite information, it took about 15 years or maybe 20, but a very long time, and it cost a lot of money. Now, if you spend so much effort and kind of come to the conclusion that it really didn't work. It's a bit uh, difficult, sad maybe. And uh, either you give up or keep pushing, right? So luckily for us, uh, the whole field kept pushing. And uh, today we have many options We generate, I would say, truly plethora of information which we kind of try to digest, which we try to work with, try to understand, although we are not truly there yet. There are different technical solutions out there, but maybe to honor Fred Sanger, essentially all of them are using the method he has conceived. So this is very simple method, conceptually, but very powerful method. So thank you, Fred. Uh, we don't know where we would have been without you, but uh, someone would crack it eventually, but uh, it was bad. <laughs> All right, so I mentioned that we can read, but we really don't understand. And we need to look at the ways to interpret that information, because again, that's the key to it, right? We need to understand what makes us thick, truly, what makes us resilient or weak uh, to different things. And of course, it would fill symposia of various lengths. So I try to distill that fact into this cartoon, which I really like. I would say that current field is a bit further than just having corner pieces. But, you know, it's a lot of pieces to, to fit together. Oops. So, let me conclude with some special case of, uh, of use of genomic information. That was the project. We were invited to participate with our colleagues from, from uh, EMB Outstation and EBI in Hingston. And the idea was, you know, the DNA is a code. That's clear. Do we agree on that? Adam, you are sleeping. You don't sleep. <laughs> so, but of course, and that has been definitely tried and tested over several thousand years. I think that's the way to hold it. I, I need to practice. So they have the idea, which they actually built upon experience of their predecessors, that basically that information which they would go into the strings of short DNA molecules that would be that information in zeros and ones and in their particular case twos would be converted into physical matter which was uh, fragments of DNA. These fragments of DNAs would be synthesized 
And then, of course, if you have a coder, you need also the reader. So the test was if they code and it goes through that individual, through these individual steps, and we read that information, that was our part, I say proudly, and we send that information back. Again, this is information, physical something, almost invisible. This is Nick Goldman, he was curious that if company didn't cheat him because he didn't see it, right? It's not like beer in your glass, but they didn't. So then we push it, <laughs> push it, push it, through our machines uh, and send it to them and they could retrieve this information. So the information they used was very, very nice. It was uh, original paper by Watson and Crick describing the structure of that beautiful molecule which we have here, or model. There was a, a collection of all Shakespeare sonnets, picture of their institute, and uh, seven seconds of Martin Luther's King Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream. Now, of course, it was maybe more like proof of concept, and I think these days it's too early to store our music and pictures there. But again, DNA is a very resilient molecule, and maybe there will be days we will be able to use it for different purpose than Mother Nature and Dota upon us. All right, so we, this is a view in our sequencing room. This is the carrier we use for reading it. And uh, it's regarding variation, my colleagues are very nice to them. I try to return the favor. And you see, we do vary. Thank you for attention. this marvelous talk. Do you have any questions for Benny here? Uh, I can't see anyone. But... Oh, you're calling me. Finally he gets his work. <laughs> it's all very nice to, uh, to read, uh, but how far are we along in uh, building? Can we build? To some extent, we can build Shakespeare sonnets, we can build uh, Martin Luther King Seven Seconds, I dream. Some pictures, I, I think that, uh, well, my, my view, we will, I think we will never be able to build something, but, well, I, I need to be careful. I think we will be able to build to a certain level, and that's definitely ongoing, there are projects which are actually building uh, yeast genome as a synthetic entity. Uh, it may have certain certain advantages to have the, the, this capability. Uh, I would say so far all the all attempts for synthetic life, if you wish, uh, at the end of the day used some surrogate vehicle, maybe. <laughs> Uh, to, to breathe the spirit agents and to make it live. So, again, I think that uh, it's uh, to a large extent due to our ignorance. We actually know very little. There are scratching surfaces. And uh, maybe one day, but not, not today. So, we can build, but very little. Yeah? Hi. Hi. <laughs> I have two questions to ask, and the first one is uh, how much information that you can store or, or you have found so far that you can talk in bytes or, or gigabyte or terabyte in a single DNA? And second is, uh, is have you have you already established any method to have a synthetic, a synthetic or lab-made DNA which can also store 
the information as you as you well it is so let, let me let me uh, answer the, the the second part we can we can uh, let's say synthesize pieces of or stretches of the of the DNA sequence but it's relatively short which is which is a problem because to cover that space and even if you have 10 million not 3 billion you would need a lot of short pieces which can be maybe 150 regarding coding uh, capacity or coding uh, competence of, of DNA of human I think the jury is still out because there's really the fact that we don't understand everything now I can ask I have a colleague in audience who's working Hoover and uh, he can maybe comment better how many bytes uh, and bits and all that but you still may take that the one letter one base is a bit right so of course we have theoretically three billion of them but do they all have the same coding capacity? That I think is not known. Wolfgang, well, please help me I out. I, I think the question was how many bytes were in this synthetic written uh, ah, information. Not many. Yeah, I think there was a couple of megabytes. Yes. Basically, a picture and ah, a I see, MP3 I see, yes. file. But that's scalable, so we could in principle put the, anything in there. The main point is that right now it takes ages to read this information, like actually weeks. It's not our so fault. It's just <laughs> yeah, generated yeah. information. So, but I think the point of was that DNA is really stable, and in fact, the oldest way of storing information that we know about is DNA. So we have read papyruses from like 3,000 years ago, reading maybe cave drawings of people from 10,000 years ago. But DNA you can actually read from mammoths or Neanderthals from tens of thousands of years ago. So in a way, if you look, the most stable way of storing information for a long time. And that's actually quite an exciting idea. You can use DNA for that matter. It's really the stability of that molecule. If it handled properly, you know, handled with caution, that always helps. Is there any other question? Any other questions? All right, if there are no more questions, then uh, let's thank Vladimir again for this amazing talk. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for being with us. And we now move to the 10-minute break, and we'll be back.